Hello everyone. Today I'm going to be reading This is the Real Me by Beerus on AO3. Summary. Everyone assumes that Midoriya Izuku is a sweet cinnamon roll with an unhealthy amount of pain tolerance. Baku Gokatsuki knows better, for he has seen the true monster that hides behind those awkward mutters. So when a self-deprecating Midoriya asks him for advice on how to improve, Bakugo decides to wake him up. Mirio, who was considered the number one, next number one hero, that was before he challenges certain first-year students' class to an all-out brawl. Talk about digging your own grave. It started with a simple, not conversation, with Bakugo. Izuku had asked what he could do to improve his fighting style. He was expecting a backhanded comment like, Try everything, dipshit, or the likes. Bakugo turned to him and looked at him long and hard. Stop holding back, was the answer. Okay, Izuku wasn't expecting this. But I am not, Izuku protested. Stop right there. I can prove that you are, Bakugo challenged. How? We can't exactly fight right now, Izuku reasoned. Katsuki grunted. I don't need you to fight. I can prove it without lifting a finger, he declared as he started going back to his room. Bring one of your latest stalker notebooks, will you? He ordered as he went off. Izuku came back with his hero analysis for the future number 15. It contained notes on the quirks he had seen at UA. Most of it was about his classmates. This got me in it, Katsuki asked. Yes, yes, of course. Let me just... Izuku ducked to find Katsuki's page. Koski looked over his head and read through it. Ha! There! He pointed out in victory. Izuku gave him a confused look. Look under the weakness section. You have written 9% salt water solution. This is also there's a, this is also the one where you brainstorm ways to beat us, don't you? Yes, Izuku tried. Ah, there's a dot after that. You had other ideas for my weaknesses, but decided to throw them away, Koski celebrated. No, no I did not. I was out of ideas. How are you so sure? Izuku protested. Because I know what ideas you had. Let me list them off. One, try to get a deep cut on his palms. Two, break his wrists. Three, break his shoulder. Four, cutting his arms off would be a more permanent solution. Koski listed off, ticking them off on his fingers till he had four. Izuku looked at the boy in horror. I would never, he retaliated. Oh, but you did. Look here, Kotsky said as he produced a notebook out of his pocket. It was labeled Hero Analysis for the Future Number 3. That, Izuku looked down at the notebook in horror. Yes, this, the original unfiltered thoughts of Izuku Midoriya. I have always treated you like you are nothing, but the truth is, Midoriya Izuku, you scare me. Your true self does. Stop holding back that mind of yours, Bakugo said as he tapped Izuku on the forehead. Aizawa says Ponytail is the smartest because he has never seen your true self. She's got nothing on you. If you want to improve how, to, how you fight, give your brain the driving seat, your unfiltered one, and let it go. Izuku had no idea how to respond to that. Bakugo had always been so, so closed off and grumpy around him, and Mom had said that he had to tone down the analysis a bit. So that was realistic. He was torn. He could give Bakugo idea a try, he supposed. The day he returned to classes provided the perfect opportunity. Shota wasn't sure if he did the right thing, agreeing to the idea of letting Togata fight the whole class. There were other ways, better ways, to explain what a work study could do, and Togata wasn't the average or realistic example. Amajiki might be one, but Togata? No. He was given... Special attention, not only was Night Eye giving him work experience, he was helping the boy with academics and court control. Togato was being trained for something special. None of the other work study students got that treatment. He had half a mind to just say no. They had no intel on his quirk, nor did they have any on his skill. The boy was overkill, and he had no sense of reading the room. He just up and challenged the whole class for a brawl. Shota knew they were going to get beaten, and badly so. It started as expected, almost half the class down in one go. Midoriya did great, no hesitation, as expected of the boy who beat muscular, but the rest of them? They were just not ready for Togata, or should he call him Lamillion? He saw Togata 
cruised through everyone and watched how each and every single one of them wanted to stand up, desperate to not be beaten, because to most of them, being beaten would mean they would be dead in a situation where it mattered. This was just wrong, and he had allowed it to happen. Why did he do that? It was his class. He should stop Lamillion now, but half of the class was still standing. Stopping him now would only mean that the ones who were downed were incapable and the ones who were standing were a lost cause. It was the message that was being sent to all of them, and he did not want it. He remembered how just a year ago he would have encouraged something like this. They got the bratty ones under check, showed them that they aren't the best, but these these brats were not overconfident. They were just starting to just barely scraping back to normalcy. They deserve downtime for the amount of tragedies they've had to face with bravery. They deserve their wins. They did not deserve to be humiliated by the second coming of Jesus. Togata was doing things the smart way. He was using the sheer lack of intel on his quirk to his advantage, taking down the ranged ones first, and then going after the melee ones, ignoring or sometimes just passing through the only actual threat, Midoriya. Midoriya was getting more and more frustrated, more and more desperate as he failed to defend his friends and they kept falling one after the other. After three full attacks, Togata had everyone down, everyone who was not as desperate or reckless, everyone who wasn't as strong and determined, everyone who didn't have the sheer amount of pain tolerance that one of his children did, everyone who wasn't Midoriya. He was hit twice in those three attacks while being passed through multiple times. Most were down after only a single punch, but not Midoriya. Togata was not so well trained in hiding his true emotions. He smiled to look like he was excited, but he wasn't. There was a twitch in his eye. It was ever so fast and was hidden, but Shota saw it. He was scared. He had not experienced or expected anyone to stay standing after his punches. Shota looked towards Midoriya. He had looked desperate just a moment ago and looked as though he wanted to launch a reckless charge that would lead to his ultimate defeat, but his stance changed to a relaxed one. He started to take a few deep breaths and then did something no one saw coming. He smiled, no, grinned. He shifted his stance to a fighting one, but not one that suggested he was going to be the one who threw an attack. Instead, he tilted his neck and gestured to Togata to come at him. Now, this was either too cocky or too stupid. None of it was like Midoriya. He was, one of, he was more of an upfront fighter and also one who respected his opponents. Was leaving him with Bakugo alone for three days a bad idea? Togata accepted and went underground. Midoriya smirked. Rather than being alert, he simply moved two steps to the right. He had heard a breath hitch beside him. It was Amajiki, Najiri's usual chatter, which he had shifted to. Background noise was silent all of a sudden. Aizawa did not know why. He had his answer in the next moment. Tugada came up with force, but was completely baffled when his hit first missed. He went for another as soon as he recovered, but Midoriya, rather than attacking him, dodged again and distanced himself from the third year. Tugura came to a stop. He chuckled and started. You got lucky there. Let's go again. Tugura disappeared without warning. Midoriya walked. He literally walked to the exact spot Tugura had disappeared from and put his hands in his pockets and rested his stance. Tugura came up three steps to the left where Midoriya was. He completely missed. He went for a punch behind him, but he had just hit air. Guess you got unlucky there, senpai. Shota inhaled sharply. He heard his thoughts being voiced by Todoroki. Is Midoriya taunting Togura-senpai? Togura turned around, his usual smile gone. He went underground again, and Midoriya took five steps backward. Togura came out four steps ahead of where Midoriya should have been if he had stayed where he was. Togura got some distance as he let his quirk rest. He wasn't relaxed, though. He just was unsure of where to go now. Midoriya called him out on it. What's the matter, senpai? Where is that smile now? I dodged one attack and you look so hopeless, Midoriya cooed. I will get you this time, 
Duguda retaliated. Oh, but where will you go? Your quirk isn't exactly invisibility or invincibility. Neither is it teleportation. Your appearances aren't instant. You're traveling fast, but not with the speed of light. Midoriya smirked. I had a theory when I saw you taking out the ranged ones first. Thing is, they were a threat, one that you had to deal with, so your quirk wasn't invincibility. You just seemed to let things pass through you. And that got me thinking, if my hand can pass through you, why can't air or light? You can't exactly see or breathe when you use that quirk, can you? You're just predicting where I would go, and since you have failed to predict correctly for so many times, you're doubting yourself. Even now, you have just one thing on your mind. Where will I be next? Will I be on the right, or will I move to the left? I can also move forward, or I can return to my previous position. Midoriya kept taunting as Tugura disappeared and appeared on Midoriya's right. Oops, I guess I forgot to mention the option where I can just keep standing here and make you look like a complete idiot. <laughs> Midoriya let out a dry chuckle. Muriel looked horrified. The viewing stands were completely quiet while Amajiki watched with horror and Najiri was quieter than she'd ever been in her whole life. What the fuck? Jira spoke out. And those were exactly Aizawa's thoughts. What. The. Fuck. Aizawa had known Midoriya was a tactician, but this? This was on a whole different level. How was he making a fool out of the alleged next number one? Hero. And so, so easily. Amajiki felt a shiver go down his spine. It looked like the initial attacks from Muriel were just... Just him being scrutinized and dissected, and this Midoriya kid had Muriel figured out in under ten minutes. This never happened with Muriel. He was always clinical and unbeatable, like the sun. But this kid had just put an eclipse to it. Muriel did not give up, though, and that was far from the only move in his arsenal. He went for a direct hit, and Midoriya, rather than dodge or block took it, and then grabbed the hand that hit him and flipped him. He went for the eyeball crusher, but again was thrown off to the other end of the training grounds by the kid who had upped the power output. Green lightning crackled around him, and his eyes seemed to glow the same color as his hair. Mirio landed a hit, and Aizawa heard a collective intake of air. Midoriya had a shadow on his eyes, and Aizawa thought he was unconscious, but he looked at Muriel in the eye and smirked. I can take your punches, Midoriya staggered as Muriel's fist landed another hit. I have endured broken bones, senpai, multiple at once. He kicked Muriel in the shins, spitting out blood from his mouth as he moved. A pause, a breath from the opponent. I have a lot more in me. He narrowed his eyes as the golden boy of UA dropped through the floor. He turned around, knowing exactly where the hit would come from. I can do this all day, he craned his neck, narrowly missing another punch with a smile. The entire time he was watching as Muriel's lack of oxygen intake drained him, he looked to the third year, heaving on the floor, gasping for breath. The question is, can you? Or are you out of power already? Midoriya said as he tapped the very tired Mirio on the forehead as he collapsed from lack of oxygen. Izuku was ecstatic. This, this feeling of accomplishment was just way over what he had ever felt. Letting his brain go for what it wanted felt so, so liberating, like he had removed age-old shackles he hadn't known he was bound by in the first place. Kotsky had done this impulsively, thinking that the nerd would just keep the brainy stuff to the fights. Well, every demon has a downside, and Izuku using his unfiltered brain had some too. He didn't care what the nerd did as long as he wasn't holding back. Najiri and Tamaki followed Mirio to the infirmary, none of them believing what they had just seen. How was a first here able to beat Mirio so easily? Most of the class had made a trip to Recovery Girl, and Aizawa had to make one to Hound Dog, and one to the bar. Fuck it, he needed alcohol to down what he'd just seen. A cynical Midoriya. No matter what, he had never imagined that the boy is anything other than a ball of sunshine. He was very akin to All Might. How had he done a complete 180 and turned into this scary mix of Nezu and All for One? Was Midoriya always like this? Was he secretly a Pokemon that just evolved? If Nezu hears about this, the world will, <laughs> will it even live to see another day? 
Azawa went to sleep with all questions and no answers. Shota's class of problem children wasn't doing any better than him. They looked as hungover as a 16-year-old could. Chugata still came up with a work-study offer for Midoriya, the poor soul. He had met with the devil himself and still thought he was an angel. Shota's faith in the evil, godly powers of Midoriya was proved to be correct when he heard from the underground community that Night Eye was sporting a black eye and was being sued for illegal quirk use. He landed a work-study offer with fat gum afterwards. Turns out the whole task force against Overhaul was in vain. Midoriya and Lemillion were enough to save Aerie. Midoriya took the fight outside while Aerie clung to him like a lifeline and Shota just, just barely caught a glimpse of um, the monster that Midoriya would become once he reached his potential. That settled. All Might took Midoriya to a meeting with All for One. The villain lost his quirk after that, and Midoriya started pulling new ones out of his ass wherever he liked. Midoriya was very suspicious, but he was somehow always able to make Eri happy. Shota did not approve of Eri being all quiet and how do I smile for anything they did and giggling like a mad girl when Midoriya showed her a video of overall getting his hands cut off. Oh yeah, the League had sent a video to the Apocalypse Child and were somehow completely under his control and were suspiciously doing all the illegal things Midoriya was not allowed to do. Shota did not care these days. Midoriya was the devil who had risen from the depths of hell and with Nezu as his mentor. He was already making strides for world domination. He wasn't kidding. One day he had just poked around when Nezu and Midoriya were having what they call analytics class when he saw it on the board. Plan for world domination number 83. Mike did throw Shota on a loop when he pointed out the possibility of them just playing a prank on him. Aizawa did not know, and honestly speaking, he didn't want to. He didn't get paid enough to deal with this shit. Thank you for listening. Again, this was This is the Real Me by Beerus on AO3. I hope you enjoyed.